Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Jonathan Lipp from the Big Apple Film Festival. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is our final day of the festival, and uh, we are presenting a series of industry panels uh, this morning. And so we are here with our very two first guests. Uh, and this morning's panel is titled uh, Nonfiction Filmmaking. So we're speaking mostly about documentaries and docu-series. Uh, so we have with us Greg Mitchell, who is an author of a dozen books, co-producer of uh, the documentary Following the Ninth. Um, he also is the uh, director of uh, Atomic Cover-Up, which is screening at the Big Apple Film Festival this week. Uh, we are also joined by Suzanne Mitchell, who is an Emmy-nominated producer. Uh, and Suzanne uh, has been uh, ha has received critical acclaim for numerous films, uh, including Hot Type, 150 Years of a Nation, which was directed by uh, Oscar winner Barbara Koppel, G-String Divas from HBO. Uh, she's also the producer on Atomic Cover-Up, which is screening at the Big Apple Film Festival. And uh, she recently um, directed Running Wild, which is now on iTunes, and has worked as a producer uh, for HBO, ABC, A&E, Harpo, Cabin Creek, and currently for Netflix. Um, so that's my intro, but I'm gonna turn it over uh, to our guests if they can tell us uh, uh, about themselves. Uh, so Greg, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, some of the books you've written and, and films you've worked on. Oh, I think you're, you're muted. Yeah, if you could. Okay. Am I All right, now? hello, Greg. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for hosting us at the uh, festival for a live, uh, believe it or not, a live screening the other night, which is, we've been in a bunch of festivals, but only I think this is our third, third or fourth live screening. So it was quite, quite exciting. Um, yeah, I've been, um, I, I basically, as you said, I've written about a dozen books. I've been uh, an editor. I've lived, lived or worked in New York since 1970 uh, and uh, been editor of mag national magazines and uh, like you said, I've written about a dozen books uh, during that time, and I've um, been involved with uh, some films, besides having a couple of uh, my books optioned for movies currently, uh, drama, Hollywood dramas, uh, potentially, you know, the, the odds of that, but um, they are optioned and uh, trying to go forward. Um, I've worked, worked on numerous documentaries, um, including a, a film called Following the Ninth, which came out about five years ago, about... Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and its political and cultural impact around the world. Uh, the director is Carrie Kandel. And again, it's been in a bunch of festivals, got rave reviews. And it's, it's also uh, out there streaming now. Uh, so I was co-producer on that. And um, more on the subject of, the, of my film here, I've also was a top advisor to a film called um, Original Child Bomb. Uh, about 15 years ago, which uh, uh, won the top prize at Silver Docks and went to, went to Cannes, was shown in the online competition at Cannes and so forth. Um, so, um, so I had, and I've worked on two or three other films as well, uh, but this was the first film I've actually directed, uh, uh, directed myself. Um, so, um, but just very briefly, uh, my background with the subject, I like to say goes back 38 years um, in 1982, I was named the editor of a magazine called Nuclear Times, which was the Bible of the anti-nuclear uh, movement at that time. And um, I met uh, and did, we did the first story on what became the subject of this film, which was the suppression of the most important uh, film footage from, that was shot in Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the atomic bombings. Uh, first by a Japanese newsreel team, an elite team, uh, and then an American military team, which shot the only color footage. And, uh, you know, it's obviously a long story. We can get into it if, later if you want. But basically, I, we did the first story. I became friends with one of the two key people of the American uh, film team. And, um, you know, we did kind of this expose revealing that this footage had been suppressed for decades. Um, uh, and then over the years, I sort of kept an eye on it, kept writing briefly about it in uh, other books. Uh, I actually wrote a book called Atomic Cover-Up about 10 years ago, which has uh, you know, the full story or more or less. Um, and then finally returned to it in doing this film. So we could, you know, we could talk about how the film came, came together and so forth. But this is a subject I've been involved with for all these, uh, all these decades. It was 
always hoped to make a film. Um, the story still hadn't been told really. Uh, I know many of you out there may have seen uh, several or dozens of documentaries on the bomb and the and so forth, but there's never been a film that, that looked at it, it through the eyes of the cameramen, through the film directors and producers, uh, what they saw, what they felt afterwards, how they tried to get this footage released. So it's, it's a totally unique film uh, among all the many dozens on this subject. Um, it's really a film, uh, you could say it's a film for filmmakers. It's a sort of a tribute to documentarians uh, everywhere, uh, what they go through with, to get uh, footage and what, what happens afterwards. So. I, I like to think of it that way uh, as, a, as that kind of a tribute. And, um, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, able to get the film together and, you know, getting pretty widely seen now and so forth. So um, that's my story. I don't know if that's a nutshell, but that's, <laughs> that's a fairly short version of my, my story. So Suzanne, I should take it away. Suzanne is no relation, believe it or not. We, <laughs> and we, live, we both live in near Nyack, New York. A great, great arts hub here. Uh, we both are involved with the uh, Rivertown Film, which is at the terrific Nyack uh, Film Society. Uh, we had never met, uh, and uh, but yet, yet when I started uh, looking for someone to collaborate on this film, her name was recommended, and uh, so we've been working together for you know over two years. And uh, but, but uh, no relation, believe it or not. And there you have it. Thanks for the intro, and thanks for having us, Big Apple Film Festival. And I'm in my car because that's where all good work for filmmakers happens. I'm actually out in the field today. And so I'm, I'm multitasking. So sorry about being in the car. And hopefully it's not too noisy. Anyway, uh, super excited to participate in this panel. But just a, a short background. Uh, I've always been in the factual universe of films and understanding how the distribution model has changed dramatically over the years, even from the time that I did a hybrid distribution deal for my film Running Wild um, to today, mm -hmm. and certainly post COVID, right? Or not post COVID, I guess we're still in COVID, but you know that whole shift of retaining certain ownerships of your film and being able to maximize the impact through your own outreach plan is something that I talk about a lot with filmmakers and more um, in the factual space than in the narrative space. Although I have worked with some filmmakers in the narrative space, if their film had a, a strong message and that there was a clear audience, um, what we call a core audience to market the film to. So that's my background. You can read more about me at fullmotionpictures.com, which is my website. And um, I'd love to, to continue the conversation. All right, thank you, Suzanne. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to type it into the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, so Greg, first of all, so you, you've worked uh, as an author. Uh, what are your thoughts about adapting books um, into films? Do you think that that is um, uh, a good thing to do? Or do you think often books are better to be left as books? Or do you think it's always good if you had the opportunity to adapt it into a film? Well, you know, there's several levels to this. I mean, one I already mentioned, when you write a book, when you're fortunate enough to write a book, kind of a major book that then gets optioned for a kind of a Hollywood or a TV uh, series kind of thing. I mean, in a way that's out of your hands. You know, you write a book that's, it may be interesting enough or has gotten enough attention that attracts attention of uh, agents and uh, filmmakers and so on and so forth. And I, you know, I've had a number of those uh, for over the, over the years. So one of, one of the, uh, I say funniest, but about the, uh, one of my, uh, the real departure in my catalog, you might say, is I wrote a book about 30 years ago, no, tw yeah, 25 years ago, about coaching my son in Little League, in Nyack Little League. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be fun. I think it was kind of funny. It was well done. You know, it wasn't anything that special in that genre, but, uh, um, and uh, lo and behold, even before publication, it got noticed by Tom Hanks, who, who's uh, one of his sons was in Little League at the time. And he engineered a big uh, option through Universal. And for, for a time, for the first year, Tom Hanks was actually going to play me as a Little League coach. And uh, they did a, did a script and so on and so forth. And of course, the usual story, it, it never got never got made. Tom became such a mega star. He went on to all these other movies. The last thing I knew, Greg Kinnear was now playing me. But, uh, and the location had been moved from Nyack to Berkeley. 
Uh, so, um, so that there's that level, and I've I've had like I have two other move two other books in option right now, but that's that's a whole another realm. That's you know, you you write a book, it gets optioned, and maybe uh, you know gets made into something major. The other, of course, is taking your own work and trying to do a film, uh, your own film, or having uh, someone else make a film based on your a documentary. Let, let's stick to that uh, documentary, and you know all of my books really are. Uh, about historical events, uh, political campaigns, uh, you know, uh, so they're, um, you know, they're eminently adaptable for documentaries. And, uh, um, but that, I, you know, that hasn't happened that much with, with, with me and these books. And, um, and so the, the new, uh, the, my atomic cover up became, uh, became something I could try to adapt myself. Uh, and, um, but the only reason we could even attempt that uh, on a super low budget was that uh, this footage is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> finally available in the public domain at the National Archives. If we had had to pay $100,000 for footage, it would, this film wouldn't have, <laughs> it wouldn't have happened. So I guess one bit of advice would be if you, if, if you're, if you only have a shoestring budget, you know, use public domain footage and, uh, you know, um, keep the cost down. But, um, but so, so, so that's one answer, you know, if you, if you want to try to adapt your own books or uh, article, uh, article or something you're interested in, of course, you have to figure out how to, uh, how to pay for it. So, uh, like I said, my solution, as it were, was to uh, <clears throat> make the film be largely public domain footage from the National Archives. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask, um, and I'll, 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 um, I'll turn this question to Suzanne, since um, you've involved in the production of numerous documentaries as, as well. Um, yeah, what are some other ways that filmmakers can acquire uh, licensed footage without, if, if they're unable to get, you know, royalty free or free footage from, you know, the Library of Congress or something like that? What are some ways to go about getting footage that on the cheaper side? Yeah. One of the greatest resources, and this goes across many projects that I'm working on right now, even the ones for Netflix, is a source called Pond5. And um, basically how it works, as does Getty Images, they are aggregate and purchase footage from all sorts of sources. So mm -hmm. let's say you need some footage uh, in the middle of of uh, the grasslands of northern Colorado and Wyoming. This just happened on a shoot that I was at. And we thought at one point we weren't going to have the budget to go there and film. We wound up going there. But we, we looked on Pond 5 and found that there was some footage probably shot beautifully for an advertisement. Could have been a car. Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm in the middle of production, so I'm getting calls. <laughs> now you're now you're living my life. So hold on one second. Just had to text them back. Anyway, um, so Pond5 is a great resource. Getty Images has more of a catalog, although they're more expensive. If you're acquiring something in 2K or 4K, that also has a price differential. But my first go-to is always Pond5. So if you're an indie out there, independent filmmaker, check out that resource they're not they're not free they're not free though right uh, no they're not free but, but they're, they're affordable affordable okay affordable. right and greg if you're using footage uh historical footage that was had already been seen let's say on news stations let's say it had been reported on let's say i don't know the nbc news would that be does that need to be licensed or is it already considered or for either of you, for that considered public public domain. Let me let me let me jump in here for a second. So for Running Wild, we were talking about um, the capture of wild horses in America, and it was big news art, news items, and obviously with full motion picture, for for as opposed to a news article in let's say the New York Times. And Brian Williams um, had reported on it when he was still an anchor at NBC before he went back over to MSNBC, and we actually wanted to use his lead in right. So we were able to find the footage digitally online. And then what we did was we hired um, an attorney for, um, for um, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on the name. Uh, it's not public, I've got public domain stuck in my head right now. Um, 
it'll come to me in a minute. So, uh, but to prove that we were using it in a context where we should not have to pay a fee. However, with ABC News, they actually went out and did a story on the capture of wild horses at the BLM feedlots. And we really wanted that footage because it was at a time when the main character of my film was going to adopt these horses. And so it really matched. So for that, we paid a heavy price, but we also asked for worldwide in perpetuity, which we needed because we went into a distribution deal with a traditional distributor and we were up on Netflix and Amazon and all the rest. So we needed to get those clearances. And for that, we paid, you know, we paid dearly for it. I think it was like $4,000 for I want to say 15 seconds, maybe less. And what about rights to uh, uh, people you're interviewing, the interviewees? H how does that work for documentary filmmakers? Do they need certain clearances? No, what we do when we interview people is we ask them to sign a release, um, giving us all the rights, including being able to use those rights in any promotion of the film. And as a rule, when you're dealing with documentaries, um, the rule is not to pay. Now, does that rule get broken? Obviously, in some cases it does, but it's not broken in a way where it's checkbook journalism because I'm completely against that because then you're not really telling a story. Like why would a person you'd be interviewing want to be paid unless they were in such dire need of, um, of financial resources that it made it impossible for them to even do the interview so you take it by a case by case but most in most cases you don't pay you will cover travel if it requires them to go somewhere we do sometimes ask them to sign a materials release if they're giving us photographs or films that are related to their story and for that we compensate so that's one way to compensate um, the person being interviewed if they require it but as as a rule you try not to offer money in exchange for an interview when you're dealing with in the factual film market. And I'm, I'm just curious, Greg, you know, you, you have um, done previous works on, on, on uh, you know, coverage of the atomic bomb, Hiroshima in America, and now atomic cover up. I'm just curious, where did your interest come from in that particular subject? Well, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's true, but in my mind, uh, I, I mean, first of all, yeah, I'm, I, I know I seem like a very young man, but, you know, I'm older than I look. But, uh, you know, I grew up in the late 50s and the 60s during the peak nuclear fear. Of, I was the whole duck and cover under the desk, all that kind of stuff, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so so I'm certainly that's part of it. But also my favorite movie for decades, maybe even to the present day, is was Dr. Strangelove, which I saw as like a 14 year old when it came out. Uh, and I just thought it was the greatest movie ever and funniest, and, and, but it's embedded in my brain, uh, um, the, you know, what was being depicted there. Um, and so, um, uh, so I think maybe that was part of it. Uh, I, I always had a certain, but until 1982, um, I, which again was the peak of the anti-nuclear movement and the freeze campaign. And I, I worked as the editor of Nuclear Times for four years. Uh, obviously, I got totally enveloped in it. I actually went to, got a journalism grant to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1984 for a month. It's very unusual. Even to this day, most uh, reporters uh, kind of go in for the annual uh, services or they go in for a day or two and then they leave. Uh, so it was very unusual for someone to go there for a month. So obviously, that was kind of uh, life changing as well. Um, and then I got to meet with and work with the, with, uh, the great Robert J. Lifton. And we uh, did numerous articles and you mentioned the book Hiroshima in America. Um, but my focus has always been on the impact of, of having and using the uh, atomic bomb and nuclear weapons in America, not looking at the whole world or the, it's never uh, uh, strictly historical about the decision to use the bomb. and. Um, some kind of high, you know, high, uh, highfalutin kind of uh, thing like that, but more what happened afterwards. And that's certainly the true with our film. It's all, it, it's really, it, it starts, it does not look at why the bomb was used or the decision or how bad Truman was or anything like that. It basically just shows what happened and the effect on people and survivors. So it's just without editorializing, <laughs> you know, I think it's, a rather artful film. I think it's a rather subtle film. I think you just kind of watch it and you 
you know, gives you really gives you something to ponder without uh, hitting you over the head. Yeah, and Suzanne, uh, you as well, how do you choose like which projects you want to get involved with? Because you've made so many different types of films. I mean, you have Hot Type, which is about journalism, you know, and you've got Running Wild about, you know, wild horses. Like, how, yeah, and they're so different. How do you determine which sure. projects? I'll tell you, let me just, I want to back up for one minute. The, the words that I was looking for earlier was fair use. If you want to find footage that is out there that you can take down now because we have a resource like YouTube, right? Um, and you really believe that it is an integral part of your film and you cannot do without it and your subjects are speaking to exactly that piece of footage, then you hire a fair use attorney to take a look at that and make a judgment call. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, how do I choose my subjects? Well, a lot of it has to do with what my own interests are. So I love character films and I love films about social issues. Um, so I think if you look at most of the things that I've done outside of the entertainment work, uh, they hit either one of those notes. So for Running Wild, for instance, he was an old cowboy out in the West who left his family at 65 years old to start an 11,000 acre wild horse sanctuary. And I met him when I was doing a very short piece for a big ABC People magazine special back in 1992. And I am as old as I look. Um, so that meeting for a piece that was gonna get cut down to like a two minute segment, I realized with my cinematographer at the moment that we met this person and spent three days with him, that he deserved a feature film because he was so much more than just a cowboy who had saved wild horses. He was a prolific award-winning writer. He was a conservationist before the word even became a popular uh, term, it's certainly out in the West and cowboys. Um, and so, it was something that was in the back of my mind from 1992. And then when I was working with Barbara Koppel in 2001, right after the, the World Trade Centers came down, she said, you know, if you don't start it, you'll never finish it, which was great words of advice. And so I risked it all and just started shooting on HD cam because that had just come into vogue and I didn't have to pull out 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter cameras into the middle of the Black Hills of South Dakota. And so that was an epic journey of one man's story that hopefully would touch the hearts of the people who watched it. And I think it did and it, it gave inspiration to people who thought, I'm too old to do this. He, he gave us a reason to say, you're never too old to do what's right or what you have in your heart. And then there's a story like Greg's film, you know, many years ago, I covered the atomic bombing for a historical for several historical documentaries. And I remember seeing I was telling this to Greg when he called me a cartoon that was done by a Japanese um, animator about the experience of being on the ground as a human during the bombings. And then when Greg started to explain to me of this footage that existed that actually showed that in living color, uh, he got me at, you know, atomic bombing. And so that's how, you know, I came to that. Other projects are just people call and say, hey, I've got the subject, are you interested? If it's something that completely goes against my values, then I'm not gonna touch it. But so far I've been pretty lucky. Yeah, just curious, how did you um, connect with Barbara Koppel? For those watching who aren't familiar, Barbara Koppel is a legendary documentary filmmaker, Oscar nominee yeah. numerous times. How did you? In the so um, there's this gentleman named Jerry Kupfer. He, he um, is a producer and he was working with Barbara at the time. He went on to produce 30 Rock. Uh, so he went into the, but he also worked with Michael Moore for years um, on a show called TV Nation. Anyway, Jerry and I worked together at the People Magazine special and I was in Chicago um, about five months pregnant working on the Oprah Winfrey show and really wanted to come back to New York where my house and my husband were. And Jerry said, hey, I got a gig for you. Uh, are you interested in meeting Barbara Koppel? And I said, absolutely. So I came in from Chicago, we met, and I wound up working on a piece called New Passages with her and another filmmaker. It was a co-pro. And from there, you know, the rest is history. Interesting. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Greg, I, I want to ask you, you know, there have been obviously countless documentaries about World War II, countless documentaries 
about the bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, what would you say, and I think you touched upon this before, what would you say sort of separates uh, atomic co cover up from some of the other docs on this, on this subject? Yeah, well, like I mentioned, most of the, most of the docs either they look at the, um, they may look briefly at the, uh, the atomic bombings and then go into the whole arms race and trace nuclear history of which there's now what, 75 years. Uh, others may look specifically at the decision to use the bomb, uh, how it came about the making of the bomb. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan made big news last month um, by optioning a book about J. Robert Oppenheimer, the sort of father of the atomic bomb, which was co-written by my friend Kai Bird and uh, Martin Sherwin, who just passed away, who's one of our four advisors for our film. Uh, so Marty passed away last month, uh, literally the day after Christopher Nolan optioned his book and announced it as the next film. I mean, it's definitely it's one of these things that's good. Okay, it's Christopher Nolan. It's going to happen. It's not like Tom Hanks, you know, with my <laughs> Little League book. Uh, so, um, um, so th there's a lot of focus on Los Alamos, on the, the making of the bomb, the scientists, uh, the Truman's decision, and so forth. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first film that looks at it from, okay, what happened next with uh, the filmmakers going into the two cities? And I, I mentioned the Japanese newsreel team um, had a lot of people on it who went on to do do big things in the Japanese industry. And, and actually with the, one of the cin top cinematographers had shot uh, many films for Kenji Mizuguchi, uh, one of the greatest filmmakers who've ever lived. Uh, and then the American team, also an elite uh, movie team, not just soldiers walking around with cameras. Uh, and one of their, they sort of uh, took on as one of their, uh, their chief cameramen, a guy named Harry Mamura, who had shot Akira Kurosawa's first feature. So you have uh, Mizuguchi and Kurosawa cinematographers involved with this footage. So I uh, think that's a hall of fame right there. Um, and so this was, uh, it, it just always seemed to me, uh, and as the lead into the whole movie was this uh, guy I met and became friends with, who was one of the two leaders of the American team who passed away uh, in 1985. Um, but from him and the, the leader of the American team, I got uh, not only uh, entree to the footage, but uh, classified, formerly classified documents, um, all kinds of uh, material uh, and photographs and so forth to use in the film. So, um, and then when we started working on atomic cover-up, I was the, was the first person to get translated the key portions of the memoirs and interviews with the, uh, members of the Japanese film team. So for the first time, you're kind of getting their story. So, um, you know, again, the, the whole film, the entire film from the first frame focuses on the men who shot the footage, that uh, they were all men, <laughs> uh, the men who shot the footage, and then what happened afterwards to their footage, how they felt about it, how they tried. There's one scene where the Japanese, um, Japanese newsreel team hide their footage in a ceiling. They take the panel out of the ceiling. They hide, to try to keep it from the Americans, they actually hide it in a ceiling. Um, so that's the kind of film it is, focusing on what uh, what the filmmakers went through. Yeah, in in, in uh, relation can to I, what can Greg I add did. one thing to that? What I think what Greg did in this film is masterful in terms of its art, right? So not only is it historic, is it fascinating, but if anybody is familiar with Peter Jackson's "They Shall Not Grow Old," which was done in IMAX, you know. Is that the World War One? Document? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All the archival footage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Similar feeling in a way where you're really in it, right? Because the people who were there, looking through the viewfinder, seeing that horrific scene in front of them, are with you, and they're pulling you through this footage. And 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 it's there's an, a beautiful, beautiful score of music that goes with it, you know? So I think you're really drawn in by the artistry as opposed to just a typical World War II film where you might hear a narrator, see a talking head, see some footage. Um, this is an experiential film, very different from anything else that's out there. 
Yeah. Um, and, and brothers, if, any, if anybody watching has any questions, uh, again, feel free to you can just put it in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Uh, in, in relation to what Greg just said, um, so there's an article that came out in Movie Maker Magazine today speaking about how to market a documentary. And one of the things it discusses is point of view and how point of view plays a role in the marketability of the film. So Suzanne, I'm just wondering, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Do you find point of view can make a huge difference in whether a film sells or not? Everybody's got a point of view. That's the problem, right? So it depends on your core audience and who you really want to market to. So I particularly suggest that if this is all about trying to reap financial benefits from a film, then before you start to shoot and before you start to edit, you have to think about who your audience is that you're going to market it to. And that might dictate um, the structure or the point of view. However, if you're a purist and revenue is not the top of your list, but your voice and, and making a point with whatever found footage or interviews that you're doing is of utmost important, importance, then you have to sort of let that revenue model slide for a minute and stay, stay the course. After you finish the film, I did this with Running Wild. And while it, it wasn't disappointing because it, it went all the way to Netflix and it had huge reviews in the New York Times and Variety, you name it. But did I see a lot of money from that film? No, but it was the distribution model that I chose. I don't think it was so much the point of view. I think it was the distribution model because we had a built-in audience of 95,000 people following us on Facebook before we even sold it to a distributor or I should say signed a contract with a distributor. And then in the end, um, because it was a more traditional contract, the distributor wound up with a lot of the gain at the beginning of the life cycle of the film. And at this point, those 95,000 people that I curated through my own marketing efforts while we were in festival wound up, you know, watching it on Amazon or Netflix or iTunes. So the revenue model to sell it myself through my own platform, my own website, which is still up there, um, was a bit depleted because the audience had gone over to those other services, subscription, video on demand, as opposed to transactional video on demand. Those are two different terms, right? SVOD and TVOD. Right. Back, yeah. I'm coming back to point of view. Mm -hmm. I, I think that filmmakers should bring a point of view to the subject matter. Um, I think that's really important. I think it's inherent in, in Greg's film that you can understand where his feelings are in terms of nuclear proliferation or disarmament. I mean, you understand that when you see this film. He, he couldn't have made the film that he made without that point of view. Yeah, and Greg, I'm curious, as an author and as a filmmaker, how do you determine if uh, a book should be made into a film or, or should it remain as a book? How do you make that decision? Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm currently thinking about two or three other films based on not necessarily books, but material I've uh, written about or I'm very familiar with. So, um, you know, if, if it's like when you, you know, when you write a book or when you do a book proposal, um, you know, uh, agents will always tell you, you have to write about what you know. You have to be, I mean, it's easy to, to brainstorm, come up with an idea for something. But you have to, to be able to get people to, to uh, you know, purchase the, publishing the book or helping on a film. Uh, you have to prove that you're an expert on it. Uh, you know, that you know a lot about it already. You're not just picking a subject that seems popular or that sounds sexy. Uh, it's, it always comes back to, are you the person to do it? You know, why should we believe that you're the, you know, the best person or one of the best people to do something? You know, you have to, uh, you know, you can bullshit your way for a little while, but, you know, nowadays, especially with book proposals, you have to write like 80 pages, a book proposal, you know, uh, with films, you know, we did a sizzle reel and a deck and, you know, and so on and so forth, all kinds of pulled together, all kinds of material. And, uh, so, you know, you, it, it's one thing to, to just kind of spitball ideas, but to really be able to move forward with a book or a, a film, you, you have to be, be really already be kind of a, an expert on the subject and be able to prove to people that you are. So, um, 
So I think if you're looking to what you want to, you know, what you might want to do in a film, even if it's a short, you know, five minute short or 10 minute short or something, is it something you know a lot about? And then is, do you have the passion for it? Because you're going to have to go through a lot to get it, get it done. Um, whether you try to sell it or not, but uh, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot out of you, <laughs> a big and a big commitment. So you have to have the path. You don't necessarily have to feel you have to express the, strongest or wildest uh you know most convincing point of view um but if you don't have a point of view you're not probably not going to get very far and but you you need passion you need need to say i know the subject i'm comfortable with the subject and i can convince other people that uh you know i know what i'm doing and um you know and take it from there so like i said that's to, to me i look back after this film i've looked back at other subjects i might return to uh, maybe not from 38 years ago, but, um, and, uh, and do something else in this realm. And also, also can I, I want to add one thing to that. I always say it's the ABCs of, of starting out. Access, A. You have to have access to your subject um, and the people who are going to talk about it. Or if it's a character, you have to have access to that character. Um, B, belief, belief in the film that you want to make on the subject that you're most interested in and see and Greg hit on this is commitment because it, you have to be committed. This is not an easy, you know, task. There's so many moving parts and if you're not committed to it, um, it's easy to allow it to slip away. Yeah. Um, and Greg in follow I know I asked you, uh, how do you determine if a book should be made into a film? Um, now, how do you determine if a documentary should perhaps be made into a narrative or <laughs> should it remain a documentary? Like you had the, the Little League film, uh, Tom Hanks, you know, yeah. How do you determine if, if a film should be made into a narrative or if you say, no, this really belongs. So this story belongs solely as a documentary. Well, you know, it's partly out of your hands in some ways. If you've written, um, uh written an article or sometimes, you know, nowadays you could have just written one uh, online article, uh, may like me a major article somewhere, um, or you may have been interviewed, you know, you know something about a subject and you do a, an interview, gets a lot of attention. And um, unlike in the old days, uh, agents or uh, producers may come out of the woodwork, you know, you don't have to write a whole book. Um, so, uh, the more you put out there, I mean, if you're looking to be approached as opposed to be the instigator, uh, the more you put out there that's, uh, you know, interesting, high quality, unique, you know, uh, expose, whatever you want to call it, access to someone, um, the more you do, even if it's a thousand word uh, web article for, a, you know, a good outlet, um, you know, the better chances you have of getting picked up and noticed and someone, you know, may call you and, uh, you know, say, gee, I'd like to work with you on a film. Um, and uh, I mean, it's happened to me in the past. So, um, I mean, that's, so that's one bit of advice. If you're, if, you, if you're someone who's a filmmaker, but also kind of a writer or an, you aspire to writing or you have access to stuff, you know, get, get, get the word out there um, and people may approach you. Uh, but in terms of turning your own, uh, I mean, um, there's um, a, um, uh, I, I wrote a book in the early 1990s about uh, Upton Sinclair's race for governor of California in 1934, a former socialist, and, and how his the scary nature of his campaign basically caused the, the modern political campaign as we know it today to be invented to defeat him with attack ads and spin doctors and everything else. Uh, so I wrote this book, and um, so number one, uh, almost 30 years later, um, David Fincher, uh, via his father, turned it into a, a major part of Mank, the film that came out last year. Um, I didn't get any credit for it, even though I was the first person to write about it at length. And obviously, the parts of the film were, were largely based on my own work. But so there's an example where I wrote something 30 years ago. And next thing you know, it's in a David Fincher film. Uh, but I also worked on a documentary. There's a, a PBS uh, documentary that was made at that time that was based on the book. And I was a, a prime uh, advisor on that and worked closely on that. Um, 
last year after the Mank, uh, all the publicity for Mank, and I wrote about it uh, in the New York Times. So there's another connection. Um, that book was optioned for a, a, a drama, a TV series or a drama. It's currently being developed. You know, who knows what's going to happen? But so there it went that, and now I'm I'm being approached to uh, do a uh, do a film, a, a documentary, or a short or something uh, based on the uh, uh, these attack ads that came out then. So, so there's one book I wrote. That book was based. I'd written two, three or four articles before then. That led to the book. You know, the book led to a uh, documentary. Um, led to uh, da David Fincher, and uh, now maybe another documentary. So, um, that's had a lot of lives, and I've had other books that have had numerous kind of, uh, you know, offshoots. All right, and. So uh, in the last couple of minutes we have, I want to ask Suzanne, for documentary filmmakers who are interested in pursuing a career in documentaries, as difficult as that may be, what, um, this is sort of a very general question, it may be difficult to answer, but what type of documentaries do you think are, I guess, the most practical for somebody who wants to actually have a career as a documentary filmmaker? Wh which ones do you think would perhaps be I, marketable? I don't know if that's, practical I, I don't there is no practical when it comes to documentaries right um i go back to what i was saying before it's about access if you have access to a story that hasn't been told a thousand different ways and and you know is sort of an exclusive look at something or someone then to me that would be a way to to potentially start your career. Can I jump in here and ask Suzanne here? What Do you think, you know, people talk a lot about today's modern, oh, explosion of documentary films and the golden age of documentary films and there's so many outlets and streaming and so forth. You know, A, is it a lot, I mean, is this a great age for to make documentary? Is there many, many more opportunities? No. Great time to do it and B, can it be monetized? Is it's like there's so much out there that basically you can't make a buck even if your your film is you know kind of picked up. It's like the cereal aisle, right? <laughs> there's so much to choose from. I think that the, there there is no secret sauce. There is hard hard work in marketing the film if you want it to be successful. And successful with the money. Successful. With yeah, money. successful to earn back whatever it is that you put yeah. into it, which many times is quite a lot of money. Um, you know, the, it's a little bit more of a level playing field today for documentaries because there are ways to do self-distribution. There's ways to four wall it if you wanna see it in an actual live theater setting. And um, this is available to everyone, right? It's also a lot less expensive to let's say film a documentary. And I'm not talking about, you know, a, an archive heavy documentary, but you know, you could film some really wonderful things on the latest, you know, iPhone Pro, right? 13 or 12, I've done that myself. So it's leveled the playing field um, quite a bit. However, what people don't consider is there is so much work that goes into the making of the film, first securing it, shooting it, editing it, getting it into some festivals. Um, and then there's this whole other part that people don't think about, which is how do I monetize it? Because unless you're, you strike it out of like a, a woman named, um, the woman who did Buck, Cynthia, she got really lucky. But she also poured a whole hell of a lot of her own money into it because she had the means to be able to do that. And the film wound up doing really, really well. It was at the same time that Running Wild was, came out about a year before. But there aren't that many instances of that. There are instances where um, a group of filmmakers did something on a Detroit fire department called Burn. This was back in 2014. And Dennis Leary signed on as an executive producer because he himself is a firefighter. And they couldn't get any distributor to look at this film to even consider it or a sales agent or a sales agent so they said screw it we're going to market it to every single firehouse across this country and they were super successful 
I mean, they they got back millions on that film. Um, so the but but that's a lot of work. Imagine calling every firehouse in America. You need a whole team of people to do that, and it paid off. Sometimes it doesn't, but you have to know that after you're done with all the hard work of filming and editing, there's a whole another <laughs> full time job ahead of you to get the film out there because. Like Greg said, there are so many different platforms and different ways to go that it gets so confusing. And some of those um, might actually not earn you A, the views and B, the money back. So you really have to think about the whole picture. Right, right. Yeah, I heard about the story of, of that documentary Burn as well. Yeah, it's like an incredible success story how they- And then there's they... another one, there's um, Age of Champions, which is uh, this guy oh. Keith. Yeah, yeah I heard that he one too. got the really runners. lucky because yeah, he what he did was he connected with AARP, which I have to say his experience with AARP was quite different than mine mm -hmm. with my cowboy film. And then that was a great story of a senior who reinvented his life. I thought, boy, that's a slam dunk for AARP. And they wound up featuring my film as an article in the AAR, AARP magazine. However, mm -hmm. at the time that I wanted to um, go into a contractual agreement with them where they would then send out marketing materials of my film to every AARP chapter across America, mm -hmm. they decided they would do that for an $85,000 fee because suddenly they realized there was a marketplace for them and they were, they were signing those contracts with the big studios. But as a little independent filmmaker, I wasn't prepared to do that. So right. um, Age of Champions, he didn't have to do that. He got really lucky. <laughs> Very briefly, a, a woman I, uh who directed this, I mentioned this film for PBS on, uh, based on my Upton Sinclair book in 1993. Uh, she did a, a Lynn Goldfarb, she did a little film a couple of years ago on her father, who was an inventor of uh, kind of wacky toys that some of us grew up with in the 50s and 60s. Just a wonderful little family film, very well done, very, you know, I think 18 minutes or very short. She made it, you know, spent money on it. She was just happy to do it. Her father's still alive. Her father's like 98 years old. You know, just a nice little film uh, turned out very well, but you know, okay. And lo and behold, it gets picked up by the New Yorker, went, ended up on the New Yorker site. It may still be there, featured there. Uh, she's made numerous uh, numerous deals and redeals. It keeps getting featured there. It got a million uh, views and this uh, early, you know, quickly and it's still going. Uh, so there's an example. Now she had a bit of a track record, uh, but nevertheless, it was, uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's a fluke because the film kind of deserved it called Eddie's World. Um, and, um, you know, it's, so, but it's fluky and it ended up, okay, gets on a website, a major, major website with, with a lot of prestige and people watch it. Uh, and um, so the big, big success, she got some money back and everything. So there's just a lot of ways things can happen here, but you know, you got to create the film first. And, you know, and Suzanne said, yes, it's terrible, uh, terrible work after that. But you know you got to get it uh, get get it done, and, and Suzanne also I think that's a very nice backup, a uh, very nice backdrop in your car. So I think maybe you should do all. <laughs> yeah, it's actually rather nicely framed. Uh, Brian, I'm a little hot here. The lights a little yeah, hot. Right? You, got, you got color going there and everything. You know, so it's uh, it's nice. There's another. You know, the, to riff off of what um, Greg was just saying, there's another film called Pickle that was in festival with me um, at the Portland Film Festival. Um, for another film that I had worked on. And it's a short, I think it's nine minutes. Um, I don't know if it was ever at Big Apple, but it is just so wonderfully shot. It's a couple sitting on a bench in their home talking about all the animals that they've fostered. And it was shot by the daughter of the couple. And it's just so cute and quirky and makes you smile and it makes you feel warm inside, especially if you like animals, including fish. Um, and that film did really well at a festival because it, it also got picked up by a publication. And then from there, I was on an airplane overseas uh, recently and it was playing. So, you know, there's again, all these other potential outlets for short films as well. Yeah, no, definitely a uh, shorts. I mean, and there's so many uh, platforms now to see, to see this content, which is so great. 
Um, all right, in, con in conclusion, Greg, can you just tell us real quick where Atomic Cover Up can be seen next? We screened it at our festival. Is it gonna be available online, streaming, uh, any other festival screenings coming up? Yeah, it, uh, in fact, it uh, was launched last night at the, the Hawaii International Film Festival, which is a great festival. Uh, and at the, the, in Honolulu, the Hawaii Festival also has a large interest from Japan and Japanese Americans. So we're very uh, happy to have it there. Uh, it's going to be, uh, that's for three weeks starting last night online. Um, and then it's going to be in the Louisville Film Festival or Festival of Films or whatever they call it. That's coming up in a week or two. And, um, you know, and we have other festivals coming up. So we're, it's, it's been continuously in festivals since March. Uh, and um, so I think if you search for it, you'll find it. But I, my recommendation is if you missed it at Big Apple, um, go to the Hawaii International site and you'll find it uh, as of last night. Great. All right. Well, congratulations to the film's atomic cover up. Greg Mitchell, Suzanne Mitchell, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. And thank you. And thanks for including us in your festival. It was really wonderful. Of course. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.